Good morning to you all. We welcome all of you to the certificate course on molecular biology techniques conducted by Spectrum Institute of Science and Technology. The session will be conducted on two days. The content covered during day one is DNA extract. I repeat, the session will be conducted on two days. The content covered during day one is DNA extraction and gel electrophoresis. On day two, we are hoping to cover the session PCR and transcriptomics. At the end of the session, there will be a Q&A where you can post all your questions. During the presentations, if you have any questions, make sure to post them on the chat box and they will be taken up during the Q&A. At the end of the session, we will also be circulating a quiz for you to be eligible to receive the certification. Please refrain from unmuting your mic and turning the videos on to avoid any connection issues. Your day one lecture, the DNA expression and gel electrophoresis will be conducted by Ms. Suki Augustine. Ms. Suki obtained her MSc in Advanced Biochemistry, University of Madras. Now, I invite Ms. Suki to commence today's session. Over to you, Ms. Suki. Thank you for the introduction, Vindya. Um, greetings to you all. So my name is Suki Augustine, and I am a lecturer at Spectrum Institute of Science and Technology. So today I'll be covering the DNA extraction and gel electrophoresis in this session. All right. So let me share my screen. So today, what we are going to see is uh, basically the DNA extraction and gel electrophoresis. So the content is going to be the central dogma of molecular biology, basic protocol of DNA extraction and different types of DNA extraction methods, downstream processing of extracted DNA and gel electrophoresis. So before going into DNA extraction, we'll talk about molecular biology. So what is molecular biology? That is the branch of biology, which studies the biological activity of living beings at the molecular level, right? So because of molecular biology, we are able to detect diseases at the molecular level and even see the impact of treatments which are implemented for the specific diseases, all right? so. In molecular biology, the fundamental theory is central dogma. So this central dogma has major three steps. The first one is replication, which means the genetic material which is present in the DNA is duplicated in order to obtain another copy of the same DNA so that it can be passed down to the next generation cells. And the second one is transcription. So the transcription means the copying of the genetic material from the DNA to mRNA so that the genetic information can be passed down from the nucleus of the cell to the cytoplasm of the cell. Because replication always takes place when a cell is dividing. So in normal circumstances where a synthesis of protein is needed, the transcription process is the one which is taking place. And then comes the translation. So translation takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here, what happens is 
the mRNA copy or the copy of the genetic material of that exact cell is decoded or converted or translated into the amino acid sequence, which can further form the primary structure, which is the polypeptide chain of a protein. So in order to conduct the protein synthesis, this transcription and translation process should take place in a living cell. So how DNA directs the protein synthesis in cell? So um, the structure of DNA was of course discovered by Watson and Crick with the help of a scientist Rosalind Franklin, who contributed a lot of data to uh, discover the double helical structure. So according to that, DNA exists in helical structure. So when there is a need for the transcription to take place, the DNA should unwind or unzip so that the genetic information can be copied in the form of RNA. So when transcription is taking place, uh, these free ribonucleotides come and complementarily bind with the already existing DNA template so that they can copy the uh, genetic information from the DNA. So during the, the transcription process, there is a hybrid formation of RNA DNA. At the end of the transcription, the RNA leaves the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm so that it can further go uh, and do the um, translation process. So when this mRNA is available in the cytoplasm, the ribosome detects the presence of mRNA, comes and bind with the uh, mRNA copy, and they start translating the codons, which are present in the mRNA. And at the end of the translation, the polypeptide chain is synthesized. So uh, according to that, ribosome moves le from left to right side of the mRNA so that they can be decoded in a sequential manner. And the amino acid sequence is proper. So now let's go to the basic protocol of DNA extraction. So the DNA exists inside the nucleus, right? So the nucleus is already covered by a nucleus membrane. And then the nucleus is present in the cell, which is protected by cell membrane and in some cases, cell wall. So in order to obtain the DNA from the cell, first we have to disturb the cell wall or cell membrane in the case of animal cells so that the cell content is released from the cell and then we can lyse the, the nucleus further and the DNA is now available in the solution. After that, the DNA which is available in the solution will be precipitated accordingly to remove all the contaminants which are molecules other than DNA. And finally, the purified DNA is obtained at the end of the DNA extraction. So the goals of DNA extraction is going to be mainly precipitation of DNA and removal of the contaminating biomolecules. So this uh, protocol uh, normally takes place in four steps, all right? So the first one is lysis, which means the breakdown of the cell barrier so that the cell content is now brought in the medium. And then the precipitation. Precipitation means the molecules which are not DNA are precipitated and eliminated from that um, lysate so that the DNA can be obtained in the pure manner. Okay, as you can see in the picture, first, the cell wall in case of prokaryotes or plants are for first damaged so that uh, then the cell membrane can be disturbed and the cell contents are out. And then in the cell contents, the nucleus is fertilized or break down so that the DNA is available along with other macromolecules such as proteins, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, which are normally present in one living cell. And then uh, DNA will be precipitated and washed once or twice to 
get them in more of a pure form. And then they will be stored in a uh, resuspended manner. So now we'll see about the first step, lysis step. So here, as I have said, the disruption of cell membrane takes place. So for this, we can add some uh, detergents or uh, chaotropic salts in the case of plant cells which have cell wall so that they can break down both the cell wall and the cell membrane. So the detergents that we normally use are CTEP, which is cetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide, SDS, which is sodium dodosyl sulfate and beta mecaptoethanol. These detergents can uh, make pores on the cell membrane and the cell wall so that the cell membrane and the cell wall are disturbed and uh, they are made discontinuous. Because of that, they are broke, broken down and the cell co cellular content is coming out from the cy cytoplasm. And when we are doing the lysis step, we should make sure we, uh, we add buffers to this lysis content. Why? Because in a living cell, all this DNA and other macromolecules exist in a stable pH condition, right? So we should maintain the pH in the same manner so that the DNA is not uh, degraded. So what buffers do uh, is like they maintain the, D, uh, maintain the pH of a solution same. So the addition of buffers to the lysis solution is important. So but, uh, here in the DNA extraction, we add EDTA Tris HCL buffer. So why do we add Tris HCL EDTA buffer is? This Tris HCL is the buffer uh, buffering agent which maintain the pH of the lysis buffer, while this EDTA can contribute to the fact that it can chelate the ions, which are specifically Mg2+, because these Mg2 plus are ne needed for the um, uh, activation of DNA. So just by removing the Mg2 plus ions, we are deactivating the DNA. So if DNA are activated, uh, like they might totally disrupt the DNA extraction. So by adding the DNA, we are making sure the DNA activity is not disturbing the uh, DNA extraction process. So optimization of life system for different DNA sources. So when we are trying to uh, extract DNA from uh, different sources, we can obtain from any source, like it could, it, it could be from a plant cell, or it could be from a fungi cell, or it could be from bacteria, or even it could be from human cell. So uh, in order to make it an efficient process, we can opti optimize the procedure by adding certain A reagents. So in case of gram-positive bacteria, so gram-positive bacteria means what? That they have a thicker cell wall compared to gram-negative bacteria. So here, other than the uh, lysis reagents, what we can add is lytic enzymes. Okay, these enzymes, they can uh, lyse the cell wall specifically. And so the addition of lytic enzyme enhances the extraction of DNA from gram-positive bacteria. And sometimes we'll have to do this lysis step twice or thrice in order to get the cellular contents properly because the cell wall might be thicker in some cases, depending on the uh, bacteria type. So in gram-negative bacteria, we normally use the general lysis buffer, which contains the EDTA, and followed by the addition of SDS, which is the sodium dodosyl sulfate and detergent. And in the case of fungi, uh, along with this lysis process, we can add enzymatic treatment specifically for chitin molecule, which is present in the cell wall of the fungi, because 
the pr presence of chitin in fungi is specific, right? So we should remove that chitin so that the disruption of cell wall takes place. So in case of fungi, we add chitinase, an enzyme which can lysis the chitin present in the fungi. And along with it, we can do physical lysis methods like grinding the tissue or grinding the fungus and ozonication methods where we use sound energy to disturb the cellular structure. And in the case of plant, uh, we normally go with a physical uh, lysis first where we crush the plant leaves or the plant tissue or it could be root or uh, leaves, all right? So whatever the so plant source is, we first will grind it so that it is uh, obtained in a concentrate form and then further we can use that concentrate to pellet down the cellular, con uh, cellular contents. So for the extraction of plant DNA, we normally use CTAP buffer, okay? Because it is efficient in plant DNA extraction. And we can also add SDS, but compared to SDS, CTAP is more efficient. And in the case of human DNA source, uh, we normally use lysis buffer, such as TE buffer, uh, followed by the addition of SDS. So in DNA extraction from human, and the lysis step also might be repeated in order to get a better quality of the DNA, right? Because um, in some cases, old samples of human DNA uh, sources might not be lysed properly in one go. So in, the, in that case, we'll have to do at least twice or thrice. So after the lysis, we should do the precipitation, right? Because there are four steps. The first one is lysis, second one is pre precipitation. So in this precipitation, we have to cover two steps. One is precipitation of proteins and other biomolecules, which are not DNA. And the second one is precipitation of DNA. So if you precipitate the proteins and other biomolecules first, the last component which is left in the, um, in the concentrate or the lysate will be DNA, right? So it will be easier for you to get the DNA at last. So in order to precipitate this protein, we can use organic methods or inorganic methods. So like detergents, SDS they, and enzymatic ag agents such as protein SK, they can be used to enhance the protein precipitation from the cell lysate. And first, the protein is the one which is eliminated from the cell lysate. Then the RNA contaminants, because we only need the DNA, not the RNA. So the presence of RNA in the uh, DNA extraction might disrupt the procedure. So we have to eliminate the RNA as well. In order to remove the RNA, we can add RNA's enzyme, which will particularly remove the RNA, all right? So the first one in this precipitation step is going to be protein precipitation. So in order to do the protein precipitation, what we do is we do a step where we add phenol chloroform isomel alcohol in a ratio like 25 to 24 to 1 ratio so that the mixture of this reagent can precipitate the protein and other uh, biomolecules present in the cell lysate. So, uh, so the addition of phenol uh, uh, will do the denaturing of protein so that the denatured proteins will be dissolved at the uh, cell lysate. And the addition of chloroform helps the protein and lipid denaturation. And isoML alcohol helps reducing the formation of foam during the reaction because the protein is uh, denatured and dissolved that the cell lysate might become 
form us right? like it will have form so it uh, having form in the cell lies it will disturb the dna extraction so in order to avoid that we add isoamyl alcohol which will reduce the formation of form and after the addition of this uh, reagent we'll have to do the centrifugation so centrifugation means like using the centrifugal force which is a type of a uh, gravitational force so using that we can precipitate the materials present in the lysate according to their density right so after you uh, doing the centrifugation we'll be able to precipitate this protein as in pellet form and even the lipids will also be precipitated so the chloroform and phenol they will create a separating layer two layers so in between the layers there will be an interface which will have the lipids and protein precipitation so at the aqueous layer it will stay in the upper part of the cell lysate so the aqueous part of the cell lysate will only be taken for further procedure because we don't need the contaminant of chloroform or the precipitated lipids and proteins then in protein precipitation step uh, comes the using inorganic salts like inorganic extraction method uh, nacl or nacl addition to uh precipitate the dna okay so let me get to that previous slide I accidentally pressed it so here what happens is now this lysate as in the aqueous form it doesn't have any other contaminants it mainly has dna right so we have to get the dna in pellet form first so that it only has dna we shouldn't get the dna in a impure, in a impure manner because it shouldn't have any other contaminants in order to do that we like pellet the dna all right in order to do that we can do inorganic solvent method for the precipitation of dna like addition of sodium chloride or sodium acetate or potassium acetate will do this step uh, so because of the addition of this salt the proteins are the remaining proteins if there is anything left it will also be degraded and only the dna will be separated so in dna precipitation step in order to precipitate the dna we'll have to add ethanol all right so the addition of ethanol enhances the precipitation of dna while na plus ions are present or like any other monovalent casein which can bind with the dna all right so the ethanol should be at least two third uh, volume of the cell like uh, the aqueous lysate form so why do we need to add these monovalent caseins is because they can eliminate eliminate the sol solvation shell that surrounds the dna therefore allowing dna to precipitate in pellet form so as you can see in this picture uh, after the addition of acetate this na3 na plus goes and binds with the po43 minus which is present in the dna right because the dna is made up of phosphate sugar nitrogenous base and but phosphate back back from sugar uh, sugar and then uh, this um, nitrogenous base these are they are the ones which make up the entire dna right so by uh, this na plus i uh, binding to the po for 3 minus it can specifically separate the dna and at the addition of ethanol will shield the na plus 
P of O3 minus complex and it will pull it inside the precipitate so that after the uh, inver uh, inverting of the cubes, which have the aqueous uh, layer of the cell lysate will make the DNA precipitate as in cloudy foam. All right. So this precipitate is very, like it's very small. You, it will be harder to see it uh, for the first time because the DNA, they, they, they are precipitated in strand-like foam. Okay. So after the DNA is pellet using this ethanol method, we'll have to wash it again so that the DNA is uh, in the pure foam. So in order to do the washing part, we'll do another step of ethanol washing. Okay, 70% ethanol, that's what we use. So it will remove the remaining salts and other water soluble impurities, but it won't affect the DNA, which is present in the uh, aqueous layer. So after we get the impure form of DNA, we will resuspend it in a buffer so that it is dissolved in the buffer. Normally we use TE buffer, which is a TRIS EDTA buffer. The reason we add TE is because the DNA can dissolve in the TE buffer and the EDTA present in this buffer will inhibit the DNA's activity as I have told you before. Therefore, the DNA uh, is secured and safe in the solution. After that, the resuspended DNA will be stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius for further analysis. All right. So this is about the DNA extraction, the basic protocol. The basic protocol can differ according to different DNA sources. Like it, it wouldn't change much, but there will be a small addition of uh, certain steps so that it will enhance the DNA extraction from a certain DNA source. So now we can see a um, demonstration on human blood DNA extraction, which took place in our Spectrum Institute of Science and Technology, all right? Welcome to the practical demonstration on blood DNA extraction. All laboratory procedures were conducted at the Molecular Biology Laboratory at Spectrum Institute of Science and Technology. The laboratory method followed the standard protocol given by the Wizardar Genomic Extraction Kit offered by Promega. All contents should be prepared prior to your procedure and in this regard we will require the cell lysis solution, the nuclear lysis solution, protein precipitation solution and the DNA rehydration solution. Apart from that, we will also require 70% ethanol and isopropanol which should be prepared in the laboratory. Yes. The tubes should be very well labelled 
and the micropipettes should be arranged prior to starting off of the procedure. To commence the procedure, you add freshly collected blood into a microcentrifuge tube containing the cell lysis solution. The blood should be freshly collected as it will result in a quality and a good quantity of DNA following the extraction procedure. The contents should be mixed well by inverting the tube for a couple of minutes. Once the contents are very well mixed, this content should be centrifuged as per the given protocol. The centrifugation takes place inside a microcentrifuge machine. When inserting the tubes, it's important that you balance the wells off so that you can ensure maximum efficiency in the centrifugation procedure. And it will also make sure that the instrument is not damaged during the centrifugation procedure. Upon completion of the centrifugation step, you can take off your microcentrifuge tube. When you remove your microcentrifuge tube out of your microcentrifuge, you will see a clear white pellet that is going to result upon centrifugation. You discard the supernatant and obtain the clear white pellet. Then this white pellet is vortexed very vigorously to ensure that the cells are further lysed. To the vortexed content, you will next add the nuclear lysis solution. Once the nuclear lysis solution is added, you have to gently pipette mix the contents to ensure proper lysis. Following this, protein precipitation solution is added to precipitate the proteins. When this is added, you will clearly see the protein clumping that is going to take place and upon a certain vigorous vortexing step, you will then centrifuge the contents to obtain the protein pellet. Meanwhile, to a fresh tube, you have to add isopropanol and be prepared for the next step. A clear supernatant and a protein pellet will be visible after the centrifugation step. You carefully transfer the supernatant using a micropipette to the fresh tube containing isopropanol. Once you transfer the entire supernatant, you will invert mix the contents in order to ob observe short strands or white strands of DNA getting precipitated in the tube. This is followed by a centrifugation step to obtain the pellet of DNA. The supernatant is then discarded and you add 70% ethanol in order to wash off the contents in the, in the walls of your microcentrifuge tube. When removing the supernatant, take great care so that you will not remove your pellet off. The washing step should wash all the wells so that the contents stuck in the wells will come into the solution. This is again followed by a centrifugation step to obtain the final DNA precipitated pellet. The supernatant is again discarded and the resulting pellet is blot dried and air dried before adding the last solution which is the DNA rehydration solution. When the pellet is very well dried, the DNA rehydration solution is added. Upon adding of the DNA rehydration solution, the DNA will dissolve in this rehydration solution, which then can be kept for long-term storage at 4 degrees Celsius or at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Thank you.
So that video concluded how the human blood DNA is extracted in a laboratory. Okay, so in this procedure, we were obtaining the DNA from the white blood cells, right? Because red blood cells, they don't have the the uh, the major erythrocytes, they don't have the nucleus. Therefore, the extraction of DNA is taking place from the white blood cell. All right. Welcome to the practical demonstration on. So, at the next slide. So. This is about physical methods of DNA extraction, like, like different methods we can use to obtain the DNA, all right? So the one we saw is the human blood DNA extraction, right? It, it was a kit method. So we can use different methods. Like in that, the first one we'll see about magnetic bead extraction method. So the theory is the same, but the way they extract could be a slightly different, all right? So in this magnetic bead extraction method, as usual, the lysis take place first so that the cellular content are released and the DNA is uh, present in the solution. And then the addition of positively charged magnetic beads specifically precipitate this DNA. Why? DNA is negatively charged compound, right? So by adding positively charged magnetic beads, we can selectively separate the DNA or isolate the DNA from the lysate, all right? So the binding of this magnetic beads, which is positively charged, makes the entire process easy. We don't have to precipitate any other protein or macromolecules, which can be contaminants in the basic DNA extraction procedure. So this is comparatively easy because we are basically just selectively extracting the DNA by adding magnetic beads. Then the, like in any other DNA extraction step, the obtained DNA will be washed again so that if there is any contaminant present in that solution will be um, further removed and the obtained DNA pellet will be, be suspended in a buffer where the DNA will be dissolved. All right. So for all these steps, uh, in uh, likewise in basic DNA extraction method, the centrifugation is an important factor. So the second method of DNA extraction. So this is silica gel-based column DNA extraction, all right? The reason why we are using silica gel is because the silica gel uh, is providing a surface where the DNA can be adsorbed or like they can come and bind to the silica gel. So only the DNA will bind onto, onto the silica gel. Therefore, the DNA can be selectively separated, all right? So likewise, uh, the first, the lysis procedure will take place. So the cell and nucleus is lysed, and then uh, there will be an addition of buffer. Then this will be transferred to a silica column, all right? So that the DNA, which is present in the cell lysate, will selectively bind to the silica surface and can be separated. After that, it will be washed and dissolved accordingly so that the pure DNA is obtained at the end of the procedure. So the next one is commercial kits available for DNA extraction. So these commercial kits make this DNA extraction procedure easy because if you're going to do everything manually, you will have to prepare every reagent like the, the phenol is isoamyl, phenol uh, chloroform reagent and the, the buffers you use, everything should be prepared manually. But if you use the commercial kit, they are efficient and they are in, uh, they are made in an accurate manner. So the obtained DNA at last will also be in pure quality, all right?
So the downstream processing of extracted DNA. So after extracting the DNA, because the initial step in any molecular biology technique is extracting the DNA, all right? Because after the extraction of DNA only, you can analyze the DNA for anything, right? So uh, after the DNA extraction, whatever steps take place, we can call them as downstream processing of extracted DNA, okay? So this extracted DNA can be used in re restriction digestion where it can be digested by specific restriction in endonuclease enzyme so that they can get specific DNA fragments because those in restriction endonucleases cut or cleave the DNA at specific sites. So you will get the desired fragment of DNA uh, at the end of restriction digestion. And you can even use it for PCR where you will amplify the extracted DNA in multiple copies. And you can further use the uh, um, amplified copies for further analysis. And you can use the same extracted DNA for sequencing. Like sequencing means you are going to sequence the DNA based upon the nitrogenous base present on the deoxyribonucleotide. All right. And you can use it for gel electrophoresis. So this is the most common method which is used right after uh, extraction of DNA because in using gel electrophoresis, you can make sure where, whether you have uh, extracted the DNA properly or whether the DNA is extracted in its pure form. And you can even use this for cloning. Cloning means what? The producing the uh, genetically identical copy of a cell or an organism. Okay, so in order to do that, you first go through the extraction of DNA procedure. And you can use for recombinant DNA technology where a desired gene is cleaved from a specific DNA and tran uh, transferred to a carrier DNA molecule so that the desired gene is expressed along the carrier DNA molecule in an organism so that the uh, product of the gene expression the protein is synthesized and harvested at the end. And spectrophotometry, it is, um, it is a method where we use to quantify the DNA we have extracted from the source. Even though gel electrophoresis is a detecting procedure we do, but it is semi-quantitative. So we can't really measure the amount of DNA present by using gel electrophoresis. But by using spectrophotometry, we can specifically quantify the amount of DNA extracted from the source. Because in this, the DNA is uh, absorbing the light at 260 nanometers and 280 nanometers. So comparing the absorbance of DNA at these two nanometers, we can see whether the DNA extracted is PO or uh, does it have any protein or RNA contaminants, okay? So this will be it for DNA extraction. So if you have any questions about DNA extraction, you can just write it in the chat or so that I can answer the questions. You'll be given 10 minutes to share your questions. So I'll assume that you, uh, every one of you are clear about whatever I have talked about because there is no questions here at all. So I'll continue with the gel electrophoresis, all right?
So what is gel electrophoresis? That is the technique uh, used in the laboratory to separate the DNA or any other micromolecules such as RNA and protein specifically because they are charged molecules using the electric current, okay, uh, which is applied on a gel matrix. So by doing the gel electrophoresis, you can separate the DNA fragments here according to their size, charge, and shape. So I have told you, right, that DNA is always negatively charged. So in a gel electrophoresis where we are applying electric current, the DNA will always move towards anode, okay, because it is negatively charged. So based upon their size, the movement of the DNA fragments will differ. Let's say a DNA fragment is existing in a little, as in very large quantity. Okay, so the DNA is a large fragment. So it will move slowly compared to a small DNA fragment. Why? The small fragment can move faster. And the medium the DNA fragment will move in between the large and the small fragment. Okay, as you can see in the animation. So the second picture shows how the, uh, the end product of a gel electrophoresis is seen under um, a UV illuminator. Okay, so here we'll use multiple uh, requirements to do run the gel electrophoresis. So at the end, after the electrophoresis is run, we'll see the gel on a UV trans illuminator. So in that, this is how the, uh, the picture will look like. So the first band is DNA ladder, right? So the DNA ladder is something we, uh, we load in the gel electrophoresis so that we can identify the unknown DNA which we have extracted from the DNA sources according to the ladder known length because this ladder dna ladder has dna of known lengths okay so now let's see about the basic steps of gel electrophoresis so here it has mainly five steps all right the reason why we use a gel is because it is a semi-liquid right so oh uh, because we can't run the DNA on a liquid uh, surface or in a uh, like a solid uh, material because it will be uh, like it will be difficult. But if you use a semi solid material like gel, it will be easier for the DNA to migrate along the gel. Okay, that's why we use a gel. So the first step is to prepare the agarose gel. And in gel electrophoresis, uh, common gel we use for DNA or RNA extraction is agarose gel. That's why it said here, preparation of agarose gel takes place first. So the second step will be pouring the gel, the prepared gel into a tray so that it will, uh, it will be, become solidified and will be in the semi-solid state and then we'll insert the comb uh, you can see in the picture the comb is added so that the wells are created on the gel because the wells are needed for the loading of dna right so if gels are created it will be easier for the dna to migrate in the gel along that well path okay and after the addition of comb, the gel, which is in the liquid form, will be allowed to solidify, all right? And in the third step, a buffer will be added. This buffer is called as running buffer. So this buffer will be basically poured on top of the gel so that the gel is fully covered by the buffer, okay? And then we can load the samples on the wells created by the insertion of comb. So when we are loading the samples, we will load the DNA sample along with loading dye, okay? And after the uh, loading of sample, the gel will be run 
at a constant voltage. All right. So the voltage we give for the uh, electric current passage in this gel electrophoresis should be constant. It shouldn't change because if the voltage changes, it will also affect the migration of DNA from the uh, from the well to the anode region. All right. And after the gel is run, uh, where and the DNA has migrated at a certain level of the gel, we will stop the electrophoresis so, and then we'll remove the gel and we'll view it under the UV transluminator. Okay. So the so these are the steps involved in gel electrophoresis. So now components required for agarose gel electrophoresis. So because we are using the electric current uh, here, we of course need the power supply in the chamber, which can facilitate the usage of electricity, all right? And then we need a buffer because buffer is needed so that the ions can pass through the gel and support the migration of DNA. And we do need agarose gel because that is the one which is going to create the gel matrix. And this agarose gel will create pores on itself so that the DNA can migrate through, migrate through those pores in the agarose gel. And for this gel casting or to prepare the gel, we have to need some materials like comb and casting tray as well. And then we do need DNA ladder because it is a mixture of known length DNA fragments. So if we have a ladder only, we will know by comparing the DNA ladder with the unknown DNA fragments, the whether they have the same length as the ladder. Okay, so this DNA ladder ha always have a mixture of different DNA uh, length. All right, and then we do need loading die. Loading die means it is a very like heavy or dense material which will facilitate the migration of DNA through the pores of agarose gel and make the uh, migration of DNA on the gel visible to the naked eye because these loading time, when they are moving along with them, the DNA is also migrating on the gel matrix. So just by looking at the loading time, because you can't see the DNA migrating with your with naked eye, right? So addition of loading eye, make it, uh, make it easy for us to visualize the DNA migration. And then we do need DNA stain. So this DNA stain, uh, what it does is it basically allow the DNA to be stained so that the DNA can be uh, seen when it is viewed under UV transluminator. Because I have told you the DNA absorbs the light at 260 nanometers, right? So it is not in the visible region. It is in the ultraviolet region. That's why we do need a uh, UV transluminator. So this is the um, picture which is showing the components of electrophoresis system, uh, which is normally present in a lab. Okay, as you can see um, at the left side, the gel tank is there and electric supply, the wires, the combs and gel casting tray. So this picture shows how the electrophoresis system looks like. All right. So because the DNA is negatively charged, it always travel towards the cathode. So the combs should be, uh, sorry, I think I have said it wrong. So because the DNA is negatively charged, it will move towards the anode, right? So the well, the well where the DNA is loaded should be in the cathode region so that they can move towards the anode region. All right. So here uh, the gel is placed in the center and uh, they are connected to it, uh, towards the cathode and the anode of the electric supply. And uh, in the dye region is where we load the DNA sample along with the loading dye in the wells. 
and buffer is uh, poured on top of the gel so that it is covering the entire gel. So the apparatus and types of gels we use for gel electrophoresis. We can use horizontal gel units and vertical gel units, but for the, uh, for the separation of DNA and RNA, mostly we do use the horizontal gel unit. Why? Because in the horizontal gel unit, the buffer is totally covering the entire gel. So because of that, the ions present in the buffer they constantly facilitate the support, uh, the migration of the DNA on the gel matrix. All right. So the horizontal gel uh, unit is always preferred in the separation of DNA and RNA. So in this case, the gel we normally use is agarose. So this agarose is obtained from um, a marine algae, specifically sea kelp. So this agarose, it exists in the powdered form normally. When you dissolve it in a buffer, it doesn't dissolve fully at room temperature. So in order to make it totally dissolved, you'll have to boil it. At, and uh, the boiler, the heating of this agarose should be at least above 80 degrees Celsius. And then the agarose will totally be dissolved and it will come in a liquid form. So when it is cooling down, it will become solidified. So that's the use of agarose. So we can also use vertical gel units. So in this case, we normally use polyacrylamide gels. It means the, um, the mixture of acrylamide and bisacrylamide gels. So this is normally done for protein separation, okay? So the gel matrices used for electrophoresis of DNA. So we are comparing the agarose gel and polyacrylamide gel. Okay, so the pore size which is obtained in the agarose gel, we can change it just by changing the concentration of the gel. All right. So if the pore size is larger in the agarose gel, the larger DNA uh, fragments can move easily through those pores. If the pore size in the agarose gel is comparatively smaller, they will only allow the passage of small DNA fragments through them. All right. And the, as I have said, this agarose is obtained from a seaweed, okay, uh, specifically a marine algae. And it is a polysaccharide made up of uh, agrobios monomers and in the gel electrophoresis the concentration normally used for the preparation of agarose gel is around one to three percentage all right and in the case of polyacrylamide gels uh, these are used for the, the separation of protein right oh and they can also be used for dna separation as well but we do prefer agarose gels so this is mainly used when we have to obtain a high resolution separation of smaller DNA molecules, okay? Because the pore size is comparatively small here uh, compared with agarose gel. And it has, uh, because of the mixture, which is inside the polyacrylamide gel, which is acrylamide and bisacrylamide, um, the, it is called as polyacrylamide, okay? And the concentration can differ from five to 25 percentage, right? So here we normally separate the small DNA fragments. And uh, using the acrylamide, um, we should be careful because it is a potent neurotoxin, okay? So when we are handling it, we should be careful. So the agarose gel, mm. because of its ability to create the pores inside it, the agarose gel is used in the gel electrophoresis, right? So it is derived from red seaweed and it acts as a sieve, like it is basically allowing the passage of DNA according to their size. So uh, let's say we are using one percentage agarose gel. 
so the cross linking there will be like tight so the pores are small sorry the pores are big compared to high concentration all right so if we use a two percentage agarose gel the pore size will be smaller because the concentration of agarose is high there all right so in case if we need to separate um, a small dna fragment we should use two percentage agarose gel for the gel electrophoresis and if it's comparatively um, large dna fragment we can use one percent agarose gel So the low concentration creates large pores and therefore better resolution for larger DNA fragments. And the high concentration makes the smaller pores, therefore gives a better resolution of smaller DNA fragments. So how this concentration of agarose affects the migration of DNA here? So if we increase the agarose concentration in a gel, uh, the size of the pore will become small. Therefore, the speed in which the DNA migrate towards the anode will also decrease because the pore is small. They'll have to move through the small pores, right? So it'll take time. That's why the speed will reduce. And if, if that's the case, we are the across gel is like uh, have a, having a very low concentration and the pores are very large, the large fragments can easily move through those large pores. Therefore, the migration of the speed will might increase. All right. So in this picture, you can see how the DNA is separated based upon a, the agarose gel concentration. So in 0 0.7 uh, concentration, uh, the DNA fragment, uh, the, uh, the migration of the DNA fragment is comparatively so right so this picture shows how the dna is separated in a ladder like manner preparation of agarose gel so now we'll see how the gel electrophoresis is run in the laboratory okay so in order to start first we have to prepare the agarose gel so as the agarose is insoluble at the room temperature, we'll have to boil it, right? So when we are preparing the gel, we should make sure we are preparing the agarose in the same buffer we are going to use for the electrophoresis, okay? So that's important. So the first thing, the, uh, the agarose, the measured amount of agarose. So, it depends for the electrophoresis. So if we, like, if we are going to do a 1% agarose gel, electrophoresis, we'll have to get one gram of agarose and dissolve it in 100 ml of the buffer, right? So that's the percentage. So according to that, we'll prepare the agarose gel. So after dissolving it, we'll keep it in the microwave for like 30 seconds at um, more than 80 degrees Celsius so that the agarose in the solution becomes totally dissolved and we obtain a clear solution. And uh, after we obtain the clear solution of agarose, we'll take it out from the microwave and we'll keep it at the room temperature so that it cools down. When it reaches around 55 degrees Celsius, Celsius we'll have to pour it in the gel casting tray where the gel, this agarose liquid will become gel, all right? So we shouldn't let it cool to, down to room temperature. Why? Because if we let it be become until it reaches the room temperature, it will become solidified. So we can't cast it in a tray, all right? And then right after pouring the gel, we'll have to place a comb so that it will create wells in the agarose gel. And after the gel is solidified, we can remove the combs. Electrophoresis buffer. So buffer is important in electrophoresis because the ions present in the buffer are the one are the molecules which are 
mm, supporting the migration of dna right because they are uh, like they uh, they pass the current from uh, both like they are passing the current from the mm, and uh, from the electric supply to uh, in through the gel matrix so the presence of buffer is important so the two buffers we normally use in electrophoresis are tris acetate edta buffer or tris borate edta buffer so in this buffer tris is the let's say if it's a tae buffer the tris is the mild base and acetate is the mild uh, acid which uh, which are present to maintain the ph in a constant manner and edta is added because we'll have to inhibit any dna's activity that can play take place in the gel electrophoresis so that's the reason we add edta we can also use tris borate edta buffer so <clears throat> this established ph at relatively content values uh, provide ions to support conductivity that's why the maintaining of ph in the gel electrophoresis at a constant rate is important all right so uh, if we don't use buffer and uh, just substituting with uh, water in place of buffer it will produce no migration because it cannot support the conductivity in the gel electrophoresis because the passing of the electric current or through the gel matrix is important for the DNA to be separated according to their size, right? And if we use a high buffer concentration, it could melt the agarose gel because it will uh, affect the gel formation of agarose, the high buffer. So we should be careful when we are adding the buffer, it should be in the exact pH we do need. And even though the TAE and TBE buffers are used for the gel electrophoresis, in the case of larger DNA fragment separation, we use TAE because it has a low buffering capacity. If we do need to separate the smaller DNA fragments, we can use TBE buffer as it has high buffering capacity. <laughs> Like there was a disturbance, that's why I, I stopped it in the middle. All right, let's start from the electrophoresis buffer. So we have talked about the electrophoresis buffer, right? So why we use TAE buffer and TBE buffer? So after the preparation of gel, we'll have to let it become solidified and uh, that solid gel is submerged in the buffer filled electrophoresis chamber. So the, the casting tray with the gel will be transferred to the electrophoresis chamber and uh, uh, in both ends, they will be connected with the electric supply. All right. So the amount uh, uh, the after the gel is placed on the electric chamber, we will pour the um, TBE buffer or TAE buffer on top of the gel so that it covers the entire electrophoresis chamber. And the um, buffer should at least be about two or three uh, centime centimeters of the gel we have placed, all right? And it should, it should not be greater than one third of the electrophoresis chamber. So the amount of buffer place should be like precise. It shouldn't be too much or it shouldn't be too less. So after it, 
we can provide the current and uh, make the gel electrophoresis start all right so if you're using a tae buffer in a gel electrophoresis running the gel electrophoresis um, uh, for 40 minutes will be enough so otb buffer as well the 40 minutes running of it will be enough it depends on whatever electrophoresis apparatus we use, okay? So the most common gel running buffers are TAE and TB, as I have said. In TAE, the amount of tris acetate present is 40 millimolar and one millimolar EDTA. But in TBE, the amount of tris borate present is 45 millimolar. So there's a slight difference, but the same amount of EDTA is present. All right, so... <laughs> As I have told you, the reason for these buffers to be present is so that they can support the conductivity in the gel electrophoresis. And the EDTA is present because it can prevent the nucleases to degrade the nucleic acid degradation. So then after it, we have to prepare the sample and load it in the well we have created in the gel, right? So that the electrophoresis can start. So for this, the samples uh, are prepared with a loading die. Let's say we are we have uh, the DNA and the low and the loading die. So five to seven microliter of DNA sample will be mixed with two microliter of loading die. All right, that will be enough. And after the mixing of loading die and DNA sample, the loading sample will be loaded on the well all right so if you have different uh, extracted dna types you can load uh, like each dna resource in each well so that you can uh, observe uh, like how the de extracted dna is um, present at the end of the gel electrophoresis so the loading die we use here in the gel electrophoresis is normally made up of bromophenol blue, silene cyanol, and glycerol. I told you, right, the reason we use the loading die is to have three important purposes. One is adding density to the sample because uh, the DNA is a very small molecule and we can't expect it to just move along the bell in the electrophoresis. So if you add something which is too dense, it will guide the DNA to move only in the well pathway, all right? And it will make the DNA sing inside the gel so that they can move along the pores of agarose gel. And the like bromophenol blue and silene cyanol, they both are dyes which give color to the sample, loading sample. So they will, uh, they will provide the tracking of the DNA migration in electrophoresis. That's why we do add bromophenol blue and silene cyanol. And uh, so they don't really stain the DNA, but they do uh, give the tracking of DNA migration on gel electrophoresis because we can't see the migration of DNA with naked eye. So if we mix it with a loading dye, we can assume that along with that DNA, along with that loading dye, the DNA is also migrated. So the voltage we use for electrophoresis. So the voltage is important. We can't change the voltage along the gel electrophoresis. It should be kept in a constant rate. And if the voltage is too high or too low, they can also affect the gel electrophoresis. So yeah, let's assume the voltage is too high. It will accelerate the movement of DNA. Therefore, the separation uh, or the resolution of the DNA separation will be too, um, uh, like the quality of it will be less, all right? So 
we can't increase the voltage so that the gel electrophoresis can be run in a shortened time. So we should maintain the voltage uh, in a precise manner. And nonetheless, elevating the currency voltage is associated with uh, two things. One is the lower re resolution of bands, as I have said, because it will make the DNA migrate faster and the resolution of bands will be uh, too low. And it can also affect the gel by causing them to melt, all right? Because uh, the generation, of, when the, the voltage is too high, it will also create the generation of heat on the gel matrix. So the heat might affect it will affect the gel and it will make the gel to melt. So we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't apply too much high voltage in gel electrophoresis. So the general conditions of voltage we use in a laboratory is 70 voltage or 50 voltage for 15 to 20 minutes or like 30 minutes. All right. So that's the normal voltage. We don't go more than 80 voltage and, and this also varies for PCR product depending on the product size. So, because if the DNA fragment is smaller or larger, if that might also be contribute to the fact the voltage can whether be increased or decreased in a gel electrophoresis. So then comes DNA staining. So this DNA staining makes the DNA to be visible in the UV translaminator, right? So the normal stain we use in laboratory is ethidium bromide, okay? This can be used as a pre-stain or post-stain as well. It means like before the casting of gel, we can add this stain or after the and after the gel is totally run, we can also stain the gel with this stain, all right? So this ethidium bromide is a fluorescent dye, it means it affects, uh, it absorbs the light at a specific wavelength and emits the fluorescent, okay? And therefore, ethidium bromide is used. Anyhow, it is a suspect mutagen, means, it can cause mutations in the DNA, therefore, it can cause cancer, all right? It is a suspect of cause mutagen and carcinogen. So when we are dealing with ETBR, which is ethidium bromide, we should be careful in the laboratory. That's why we do have a separate gel room, normally in any laboratory for the gel electrophoresis. And after the staining of DNA, the DNA, the gel will be moved to the UV transluminator so that we can observe the DNA which is separated under the UV uh, translamination. And when we are transferring the gel from the electrophoresis chamber to the UV translaminator, we should be like cautious and wear gloves because it is already contaminated with the ETBR. So the effectiveness of ethidium bromide. There are different types of dye we can use to uh, observe the DNA in gel electrophoresis, but we normally go with ETBR. Why? Because it, is, it has a good sensitivity, like it can even detect 0 0.1 mi mi micrograms of DNA. And comparatively, it is inexpensive. And it is also convenient because you can use it as a pre-stain or post-stain. Like you can add the ETBR before the casting of gel or even after the gel electrophoresis is run. And uh, this stains within 15 minutes. So it is. Uh, it takes a small amount of time to stain the DNA. And you can also reuse this ETBR stain, all right? So that's why it is most effective in gel electrophoresis. Visualization of the agarose gel in a UV translimator. So this picture shows 
how uh, it is seen under the uv transluminator right so after placing the gel in the transluminator uv transluminator we will cover it with the lid and we will turn on the uv light so uh, that uv light will be around the nanometer where the dna can be visible so it should be around 260 to 280 nanometers so in that the dna uh, which is tagged with this o stain with this dna stain which is etbr will be visible because the etbr will emit the fluorescence which is normally in orange color so there you will uh, we can uh, when when the color is there along with that the dna is also present alternative dyes we can use for visualization of dna so eat and eat like other than etbr we can also use some other um, dna stains such as cyber gold cyber green crystal violet and methyl blue so compared to ethylene bromide this um, ethylene blue and crystal violet dna stains have low sensitivity so the etbr has sensitivity to 0.1 microgram of dna but in this case they have sensitivity to the methyl uh, to the DNA will be like lower than ethidium bromide. So we can't use it if we want to do it in an efficient manner. But we can, of course, use cyber gold and cyber green dyes, but they are more, uh, more costly. But they have a high, uh, high sensitivity compared to ETBR. All right? And it is safe because ETR is a mutagen, but cyber green or cyber gold, they are safe and they have high sensitivity but they do take more time to stain compared to etbr because they do take 30 minutes to stain but etbr it only takes 15 minutes and the solution after stained cannot be reused like etbr the stained dna all right and this is expensive and they do need blue light transluminator because in that light only this uh, this stain dye uh, you know dyes stain dyes can um, emit the fluorescence so the dna can be observed so now we can uh, go to the demonstrative video we have done in our spectrum institute of science and technology for agrostial electrophoresis okay let's start Welcome to the practical demonstration on agarose gel electrophoresis. All laboratory procedures were conducted at the Molecular Biology Laboratory at Spectrum Institute of Science and Technology. To perform agarose gel electrophoresis, we will require the gel casting tray, combs, the voltage unit and the gel tank. Before we commence the agarose gel electrophoresis, we have to prepare the agarose gel. The agarose gel is prepared by dissolving agarose on the buffer solution which can either be the tris acetic acid EDTA buffer or the tris boric acid EDTA buffer. The solution is prepared by heating and is poured on the gel casting tray where the combs will be inserted. Once the gel solidifies, the combs have to be removed very carefully Make sure that you do not damage the wells while removing the comb. You remove the excess gel off and then you put your gel inside your gel tank. Make sure the gel is completely covered by your buffer solution and all the wells are completely dipped in the buffer solution. When loading, you will require to add your loading dye before you add your sample. So here you take the required volume of loading dye which would contain the loading buffer which will allow the DNA to settle inside the well by adding a density and the tracking dye which will allow the visualization of the migration of your DNA during the gel run. You also can add a DNA ladder, which is a predefined ladder containing fragments of different base pair sizes. Here we are using a 1 KB DNA ladder that will separate into fragments with specific 
base pair sizes of DNA. When you add your sample onto your loading die, you mix the contents very well before you load into the gel. This is a very important step as it will allow the mixing of all contents with the loading die in order to be loaded into the gel. Once all the contents are taken, you carefully load it into the gel. Make sure that you do not damage the wells during your loading step. Once the gel is completely loaded, you will close the gel, gel tank and then set your voltage and your time for your gel run. Once the time is set, you can begin the gel run and when the gel run begins, you will see the DNA bands separating as per the indication given by the tracking die. Once the gel run is completed, you will transfer the gel onto the UV trans illuminator for observation. Here, the DNA visualizing agent, which is ethidium bromide, is used. Ethidium bromide staining can be done as two steps, either as pre-staining or post-staining. In this video, ethidium bromide was added during the preparation of the gel, which is the pre-staining technique. During post-staining, ethidium bromide will be added after the gel run. Ethidium bromide is an intercalating agent that intercalates between DNA and illuminates under UV. So here you see your DNA bands being illuminated under the UV trans illuminator. Thank you. So this is the practical demonstration of agarose gel electrophoresis, right? So now, welcome. If you have any questions regarding the gel electrophoresis, you can ask. You can ask in the chat. All right, if there's any questions, you can put them on the chat box now and Ms. Suki will attend to it. All right, that marks the end of the session for today. We will be circulating a quiz to every one of you. You will receive the quiz before 3 p.m. today and you have time till 10 p.m. tonight to submit all the answers to be eligible for the certificate. Thank you all for joining for today's session and we hope to see everyone tomorrow. Have a nice day. Bye.